I'm Isahna, the founder and owner of Her Apparel, a mother's clothing brand. Top Startup has been one of the best things that ever happened to my life, if not the best. My name is Modula Menfati, founder and farm manager ML Poultry. Before Top Startup 2018, this used to be my poultry house with about 200 chickens. And today, ML Poultry has just built a new farm with a production capacity of up to 4,000 chickens. I'm Ivo Lorenz Mendy. I'm the, the CEO and the founder of Cameco. The top startup, we're able to uh, register the company in Ghana as a, as, as a limited, let's like ride Africa, uh, Ghana limited. I urge every single young entrepreneur out there to give it a try. It's a life-changing experience. Welcome to Star TV News, the headlines this hour with me, Mimini Jufadera. Meet the 90-year-old victim of James Witch Doctors. President Barrow accords to Muldeus welcome in Salem. Dr. Cissé Clare's heir over Taliban so the advisor rule. President Barrow promises $66 million electricity project for rural Gambians. On the international scene, Sudan, one of 10 countries most vulnerable to climate change. Exiled Egyptian contractor says he has a plan for change. Zimbabwe security forces attack opposition supporters. Those were the headlines and now the news in details. Masirandeng Bojang was over 80 years when she was captured in a village called Jambur, a settlement located some 52 minutes drive from Banjo. On Wednesday, the Truth Commission had before it for the first time a witness who is over 90 years old. It is Masirandeng Bojang, currently the eldest alive in Jambur. Bintakoli reports. Masirandeng Bojang was over 80 years when she was being captured by so-called witch doctors operating on the blessings of Gambia's former president, Yaya Jame. In 2009, several hundred people were captured from various parts of the country and forced to drink a concussion. The Truth Commission is in its second week of hearing into the activities of the witch doctors. So far, 18 people have testified and on Wednesday in Jambur, the first village, the commission held its hearing since its establishment in January. People had the sad story of an old woman who was humiliated and forced to drink a concussion. The intense hit the village and her poor health would not deter her. The commission tent under which she testified was about 100 meters from her compound. Mass rending lives near the market and the village mocks. As most witnesses recall, that was the final stop of the bus that took them out of their village, supposedly to be cured of an unestablished ailment. I was selling peanuts in the village when one man held my hand and asked me to get into the bus. I asked them where they were taken, but they did not respond, she said. This was on January 28, 2009. With all age and ill health, Mass Rending could only remember so much. As she testified by her sat Ablai Bojang, a private security consultant who is the old woman's son. Ablai was not in the village when the so-called witch doctors invaded Jambur. He, however, received a call from a relative informing him that his mother and other relatives were kidnapped. That for him was a frustrating moment. Ablai was to endure that frustration until late evening the following day when he got the news that his mother and others were released. This was on Thursday and on Friday. Ablai visited the village from there. He started recording the names of people that were taken. He got 62. However, after careful examination, he realized that out of his list, 49 were victims of Jambur, he said. My stomach pains until this moment. I cannot do anything, said Marcy Rending. The effect that this concussion has on this old woman is consistent with the narrations of other victims. Victims suffer excessive body age, excessive headache, boring vision, and hypertension, among others. 18 witnesses have so far testified before the commission on the witch hunting, and 14 of them were forced to drink the concussion. According to accounts, 18 victims have died in Jambur while others live with lasting health implications. 
The commission completes its hearing in Jambur on Thursday, on November 25th. The commission goes to Fonyi, the region of former President Jame, which, according to accounts, is the most affected region in the country. Bintakoli, Star TV News. Gambian President Adam Barrow was accorded tumultuous welcome in Kaur, Lower Salem district of the country, amidst jubilations, fanfare and entertainment from cheering crowds who welcomed him from Balanga right down to Kaur, that the chime files in the story. The president was escorted into the provincial town of Kaur by host of horse and donkey riders, as well as motorbike riders where he held his first meeting in the Central River region of the country. Speaking at the occasion, President Barrow held the people of Kaur by the far the people of Salem for the warm welcome he received, and his delegation acknowledging that the welcome received at Kaur was the best. The Gambian leader appealed to the Gambians to nurture the peace and tranquility of the country continues to enjoy, disclosing that there is a minority group in the country that are bent to destabilize the country at their personal expense. There is minority group trying to force themselves to power, but that cannot happen without due process. For the interest of one single individual, they want to destabilize the country, but they want us to sit and watch, which we will not allow. If they cannot bear with us until the 2021 election, then let them relocate to another place as Gambians only have the Gambia to live in, President Barrow said. Barrow said his government will not stand by watching few Gambians to stabilize, to destabilize the country against the interests of the majority Gambians, who are only interested in peace, adding that Gambian government will not allow any form of violation as the country. For his part, Tourism and Culture Minister Honorable Hamad N. Keba said the people of the Gambia has a lot to learn from the people of Salem. Reporting for Star TV News, I am Dado Cham. Dr. Ismail Sisi has said if President Adam Mubarak appoints him advisor, he will accept as it is about the country, as he responded to critics regarding his new role as policy advisor to Kanifin Municipality Mayor Tali Ben Souda. More on this story with Jacqueline Kuli. Mayor Ben Souda on Wednesday announced the appointment of Dr. Sisi as his new policy advisor. But the move has generated criticisms in some quarters, with some people arguing Dr. Sise was being tapped for a role he has no idea about. Dr. Sise responded to critics Wednesday evening, telling the Fatu Network, Talib is doing a fine job at KMC, and this is the time when we should put politics aside and our personal interests and look at the greater interests of the country. You have a young man who has a vision for this country, who wants to do a good job for KMC and wants to tap my expertise. I think I would do injustice to this country if I should refuse to help him because of, my political Im because of my political ambitions or because of politics. Now, if it's something I wouldn't be able to do because I lack the competence or capacity or expertise, I would turn it down. I took it out of the good faith that with the guys doing a good job and having a clear vision for KMC, my expertise in the area of policy and in terms of development will help him work for KMC. Today, if Adam Abara appoints me to advise him, I will advise him. It's for the country. I am not helping Adam Abara. I am helping the country as a large. So obviously, if it's Adam Abara, if it's Rohi Malik Law, anybody I know has the heart to do some good work for the country and you demand my expertise, I will gladly help you. And I told Talib it's voluntary. I am not going to be paid a dime. It's not a full-time job. It's a voluntary job. Whenever he needs my advice, I advise him. When I think he implementing a development project, I will advise him. Jacqueline Coley, reporting for Star TV News. Gambian President Adam Mubarak has disclosed plans by his government to bankroll $66 million World Bank funded project EMAC for the distribution of electricity across the country. A Jacqueline signing reports. President Barrow made the disclosure at Saba, Salekenye and Farafenye where he continues his mid to people tour of the country meant to engage Gambians on government plans and programs as well as garner first-hand information on how matters stand across the country. World Bank has given government $66 million meant to expand electricity sector and this funding will be used to provide electricity to Gambian people including communities in North Bank region. The OMVG project will soon reach its final stage and communities including Farafenye will greatly benefit from these projects, President Barrow told jubilant cheering crowd. According to him, 
His government will no longer entertain credit buying for groundnut farmers across the country, disclosing that this year, modalities have been put in place to buy farmers their monies, immediately they sell their nuts at the secos. The said farmers across the country will also be provided with fertilizers at subsidized prices so as to reduce the cost of farmers, adding that each bag of fertilizer costs $1,700, but government will pay $1,000 so that farmers can be able to get each bag for $700. Next year, farmers will receive their fertilizers as early as April with some farming equipment. President Barrow disclosed. The Gambian president also applauded the President Barrow Fans Club for the tumultuous welcome accorded to him in the North Bank region, revealing that he was given assurances that the whole North Bank will come out to welcome him and this has been manifested all throughout North Bank including Farafenye. Karamu Jarama, former chairman of the United Democratic Party UDP, who now defected to President Barrow Fans Club, said he has tried every effort to break reconciliation between President Barrow and lawyer Usain Odabo, to no avail, and have now joined the President Barrow Fans Club to help the President in realizing his dreams for the country. According to him, he will try every effort to bring more support for President Barrow in the North Bank region, disclosing that over 500 people are already ready to cross carpet to President Barrow Fans Club. Ajakadi Sanyang. Star TV News. And now on the international scene, Sudan has been named by the Red Cross as one of the 10 countries most vulnerable to global climate change. Al Jazeera's Heba Morgan reports from the state of North Kordofan, where the ecrogen desert is forcing villages to move. Adam Youssef has seen drought hit his village twice. That was back in the 1980s. He says both times people weren't forced to leave. But in the past few years, a buildup of sand dunes has forced some to move their homes. 20 years ago, there were only a few dunes and they weren't as high as they are now. We used to have so much grass between the houses here that when the rainy season came, we had to cut through them to make our way. Now it's the rainy season, but there are only sand between the houses. Adam's village lies on the Sahel Belt in Sudan's North Kordofan state. It's one of several states the International Committee of the Red Cross says is being affected by global climate change. Once known for its lush vegetation, that's rapidly changing as the Sahara Desert in the north expands southwards. According to authorities, dozens of villages have already been buried as a result of the expansion. Herders here say that's also reducing their livestock. We used to be able to easily feed our animals, but in the past few years, it's becoming hard to find food. We travel for miles to look for grass and try to give them water, but in the meantime, they're slowly dying. People are now relocating settlements that have been around for generations to survive. Not every part of Umar Ishaira is covered by sand. In some areas, plants like these, commonly known as the apple of Sodom, and this, called the broom brush, can be seen. And people here say they help keep the landscape as it is. But environmentalists argue they show that the area is close to becoming a desert. Expanding deserts can also be deadly. International observers say the seeds of the Darfur War that killed at least 300,000 people and displaced more than 3 million were sown in the 80s. Back then, drought forced villages to move further south. And that led to violence in areas where people were already dealing with scant resources. It's seen by some as the world's first modern-day climate conflict. As people leave their historic lands in North Kordofan, scientists are working on ways to help them limit environmental damage. Some people cut the trees to make charcoal or to build homes without realizing that they're removing the barriers that keep the deserts at bay. So we've started raising awareness, but also planting trees that fix the soil like gum arabic and planting them. But climate change is a worldwide phenomenon, so for any mitigation effort to work, those not affected by it here in Kordofan also have to act. Adam and others in his village are being told if they don't act now, they could be forced to leave. And he says the younger generation will then never know the lands of their ancestors as they lie buried under the desert. Hiba Morgan, Oma Ashera, North Kordofan. 
A former Egyptian army contractor whose online videos inspired real street protests against Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has announced that he will soon reveal what he calls a plan for political change in the country. Muhammad Ali made the announcement in London before embarking on a tour of Europe and the U.S saying he wants to unify the opposition and overthrow al-Sisi, Al Jazeera's Navy Baker reports from London. He describes himself as an accidental revolutionary, but Muhammad Ali is now embarking on something very deliberate, a plan to unite Egypt's opposition and the country against President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. He says he's assembled a team of experts who will present the Egyptian people with a political program in a matter of weeks, without going into any further detail on the program or who the so-called experts are. Ali then wants to hold an online referendum on the plan, and if he gets enough support, he's hoping for a change of leadership within a year. If Sisi fails to go quietly, Ali's threatening to provoke more protests. In the coming days, our program will be presented to Egyptians. We'll then ask Sisi to leave. If he doesn't leave, we'll start a revolution against him. Ali was once the head of a large construction company, raking in lucrative contracts from the army and police. He describes it as a shady world of bribes and nepotism. He says he built a palace for Sisi, intelligence headquarters and hotels owned by regime members. But he fell out of favour with powerful people and was blocked from further business. <laughs> this is how he responded. Unscripted videos ridiculing Sisi whilst in exile in Barcelona. He alleged corruption at the highest levels. The clips quickly went viral, inspiring some protests in several Egyptian cities in a country where more than 30% of people live in poverty. During those protests, more than 4,000 people were arrested. Ali says he stopped the videos for now, feeling a personal responsibility for those who answered his calls to protest. But for someone with no political experience, who made his fortune working as a contractor for the Egyptian military, part of the corrupt system he wants to overturn. Ali is now trying to build some credibility. You're somebody that has done very well for working with the current Egyptian regime. Can you explain when the moment happened where that relationship turned bad and what is motivating you now to do this? I was brought up in a culture that made me believe that our leaders knew what they were doing and that they were honourable and respectable people. We're told not to talk about politics or get involved in it, that it was larger than us. We were frightened of it, but we understood that a single person controls the destiny of everyone. That's when I began to understand how the government works. The CC leadership has dismissed Ali as a troublemaker and a traitor, something he rejects. Social media has given him the power to mobilize some people. The fight against Sisi, he says, is entering a new phase. Neve Barker, Al Jazeera, London. Riot police in Zimbabwe had attacked the main opposition party supporters with batons, tear gas and water cannon. They had gathered to hear the movement for democratic change leader Nelson Chema's speech on the country's struggling economy, which is undergoing the worst recession in 10 years. Chema's supporters says the government has been heavy-handed in dealing with opposition demonstrators and needs to do more about the lack of foil and medicine. Al Jazeera's Haru Mutasa reports from Harare. They came to hear their leader speak. Instead, the opposition supporters were met by riot police, who made it clear they weren't allowed to attend a rally organized by Nelson Chamisa, the head of the Movement for Democratic Change Party. Zimbabweans are struggling to deal with the worst economic crisis in a decade. There are shortages of basic commodities, including fuel and power. When Chamisa arrived, he said he wanted to tell Zimbabweans what his MDC party planned to do about the economic crisis, saying President Emerson Manangago and his ruling ZANU-PF government has failed. The MDC is a large movement in this country. It cannot be banned by another political party. Uh, uh, for that reason, uh, uh, we uh, are ashamed that uh, Mr. Manangago will decide to use uh, the military and the police in the way he has done this morning today. But uh, the effect of the matter is that that's not going to change. It's not going to uh, uh, give Nangagwa legitimacy and it's not going to stop uh, the MDC from moving forward with its programs and agenda. 
The police had earlier given permission for the rally to go ahead, just outside the capital's central business district. But the MDC wanted to gather outside party headquarters in the city centre. The police say the reason why they didn't allow this rally to go ahead is because they were concerned there would be violence. That's why they deployed in full force. The MDC, the opposition party, say they will still continue trying to hold gatherings, trying to hold rallies, because they say, as far as they're concerned, this is an infringement of their rights to express themselves. The police have banned several MDC gatherings this year. Human rights workers have often criticized security forces for using excessive force when dispersing crowds. This year, the endedness points to where we have gotten in terms of sinking as a country. We, 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 where we, some are talking about the dialogue, others are busy, are busy brutalizing citizens who simply want to express themselves. I witnessed an old lad, uh, unarmed but the police go went for him. Anger seems to be mounting as the economy worsens. But in a country with a history of repression, speaking out against the government can sometimes be dangerous. Harumitasa Al Jazeera, Harare. Iraqi women have turned out in huge numbers at the demonstrations currently gripping the country. Volunteer medics, artists and orators, women of all ages are out fighting for change. Al Jazeera's Mahmoud Jamjun met some of them at the protests in the capital Baghdad. For Um Noor, this is a moment that could not be missed. As she accompanies her three daughters to Tahrir Square, the epicenter of anti-government demonstrations in Baghdad, and tells us how it was a sense of patriotism that compelled her to come out and show her support. My daughters feel exactly the same. They say, Mom, we have to go out. This is our country. Why are we staying home or going to school while our youth and other Iraqis are sacrificing themselves? This is the fourth time they've visited. It likely won't be the last. Our generation is strong. They are the pioneers now. There will be a change, God willing. Anti-government protests in Iraq, which have been massive, began in early October. Since the start, women have joined in large numbers. Activist Nadia Mahmoud makes regular appearances in Tahrir Square, urging her audiences to demand equal rights and opportunities for everyone. She tells me seeing so many women out here has been encouraging and inspiring. This is something new. It is absolutely new and it's so refreshing and so pleasant thing to see. Because the reason why women didn't participate before, because families, you know, prevent them from taking part in the demonstrations. But this time I think families as well were encouraged to for, and encouraged their women to come. Here, many of the women protesters also volunteer as medics, treating the wounded even as they call for change. But in other parts of Tahrir Square, a more creative form of dissent. Murals paying tribute to the spirit and strength of Iraqi women. Created by women, admired by them too. The presence of so many female protesters here, women who represent virtually every segment of Iraqi society, is remarkable. Not only have they continued to come out day after day, but they insist they'll keep on doing so, no matter how dangerous the situation may become, until the government meets their demands. Paint isn't only going up on the walls. Um Mustafa, her face covered in the colors of the Iraqi flag, wants to make sure everyone can see clearly how proud she is of this movement. We'll stay out here for the sake of the young men and women, and I'm not afraid, not from political parties, not from infiltrators. Long live Iraq. Long live Iraq. A rallying cry that traverses gender lines and transcends the generational divide. By Iraqi women, but for all Iraqis. Mohammed Jamjoum Al Jazeera, Baghdad. And before we end the news, a recap of our main headlines. Meet the 90-year-old victim of Jamis witch doctors. President Barrow accords the Milji's welcome in Salum. Dr. Sisi Clare's heir over Talib Ben Souda at Pfizer rule. President Barrow promises $66 million electricity project for rural Gambians. 
That's all for this edition of the news. Please enjoy the rest of our programs and join us tomorrow for more news. Thank you. a mother's clothing brand. Top Startup has been one of the best things that ever happened to my life, if not the best. My name is Modula Menfati, founder, farm manager, ML Poultry. Before Top Startup 2018, this used to be my poultry house with about 200 chickens. And today, ML Poultry has just built a new farm with a production capacity of up to 4,000 chickens. I'm Ivo Lorenz Mendy. I am the, the CEO and the founder of Cameco. The top startup, we're able to uh, register the company in Ghana as a, as, as a limited, let's like ride Africa, uh, Ghana limited. I urge every single young entrepreneur out there to give it a try. It's a life-changing experience.